from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. A calling. He just said we need to do foster care. How one farm family is changing lives and helping them heal by showing grit with grace. A deadline looms for the rail industry. They're looking at essentially not receiving their grandchildren on time. The latest is the industry faces the possibility of thousands of workers walking off the job. A shock to the markets. A lot of moisture, pod counts are pretty solid. And so I'm a little bit surprised by seeing yield drop. USDA gives us an updated look at the size of this year's corn and soybean crops right now on Agri. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Weather stress is taking a toll on corn and soybeans as USDA makes a big cut to production for both crops. The change coming in the latest supply and demand report with soybeans being the biggest shock to the market. Now let's break these down. For corn, USDA is now predicting 172.5 bushels to the acre. That's a drop of almost three bushels, and that means production is estimated at just under 14 billion bushels, down 415 million from last month. Now for soybeans, they are now calling for 50.5 bushels to the acre. That's down 1.4 bushels from August. Production now forecast to be 4.4 billion bushels, down 152 million. So what does this mean for ending stocks? For corn, it means a big drop, down 169 million bushels to 1.2 billion. For soybeans, ending stocks are projected at 200 million bushels. That's down 45 million from last month. Now, most of the trade was expecting USDA to cut corn yields and production, but they were surprised with the numbers for soybeans and cotton. Ag Day's Michelle Rook has those details. Clinton, the big surprises in the report came first in soybeans, with USDA cutting that yield by 1.4 bushels per acre, and the agency cut harvested acres by 600,000, which dropped soybean production by 142 million bushels. However, demand was cut 90 million bushels, putting stocks down to a very tight 200 million bushels. You know, average trade guess was 51 and a half, but I think a lot of folks were kind of thinking that it would stay fairly close to USDA. You know, whenever you look at the differences between the pro farmer tour for both corn and beans, uh, as far as beans were concerned, pro farmer felt like it was fairly close to USDA. A lot of moisture, pod counts were pretty solid. And so I'm a little bit surprised by seeing yield drop. For corn, the cuts to yield production and ending stocks were right in line with trade estimates, but USDA unexpectedly cut harvested acreage by 1 million acres and then offset it with a 250 million bushel cut in demand. That included feed in residual ethanol and exports. Now, Bennett sees very little room for additional demand cuts ahead, which is a bullish scenario. If yield continues to get lower, which a lot of times a small crop gets smaller, uh, we're going to run out of places to cut. So I think the, the price is definitely going to have to do the work if that indeed comes to pass. Bennett says that will make the October report critically important because it will include harvest data. And if yields drop below 170, the corn market could go much higher. Now, the other big surprise was USDA raised cotton production by 1 million bales, which increased ending stocks by 900,000 bales. Both were well above trade estimates. We'll talk about market reaction coming up. All right, thanks, Michelle. Now we're continuing to monitor this. Tens of thousands of U.S. railroad workers could be on strike by the end of this week, adding a potential new shock to supply chains, and it would have a huge impact on the ag industry. While 10 of the 12 railroad worker unions have struck deals to avoid a strike, the holdouts include the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen and the International Association of Sheet Metal, Air, Rail, and Transportation Workers. Now they account for more than 90,000 rail employees. Union workers want salary increases and back pay for hours worked since 2020. Now railroads warning last week they may impose limits on certain shipments starting Monday. If they do go on strike, it could bring 40% of the nation's freight to a grinding halt. We're hearing um, grain shipments on some railroads could stop as soon as Wednesday. So we're talking a couple days in advance of the strike. Um, the reason is, is because the railroads, they don't want to have their, you know, the cars and equipment um, out in, you know, areas of the country where they can't protect them very well. Now on Sunday, Norfolk Southern said in an online notice that it, quote, has begun enacting its contingency plans for a controlled shutdown of our network 
for Friday. Union Pacific and CSX also announcing similar plans. BNSF urging its customers to call members of Congress to prevent any interruptions. Fall is in the air in portions of the Great Lakes and Northeast. Meteorologist Matt Yurisavik lets us know how long these cooler conditions will last. Matt? Yeah, Clinton, that's right. We've got more unsettled weather in the east. Lots of warmth through the middle part of the country, and that's eventually going to spread back to the east coast as we head through the end of this week. But let's take a look at that jet stream on this Tuesday where we've got more unsettled weather, that low still moving through parts of the Ohio Valley and going to move into the northeast, bringing more rain along with it. Cooler temperatures there as well. Temperatures in the upper 60s, low 70s in parts of the Great Lakes and the Northeast. Still warm though across the middle part of the country where that ridge continues to build and it's going to build back into the eastern half of the country as we head through the end of the week where we'll see temperatures back in the 80s and 90s across the east. Still a little bit cooler in the southwest, more unsettled weather there, especially in parts of Utah. Take a look at the rainfall as we head over the next 10 days. A lot going on in parts of the west, and then it looks like another system will break out in the northern plains and the center part of the country through the weekend and into early next week, and that's something that we'll continue to track right here on Ag Day. And harvest is rolling in Canada. Tyler Bartmanovich lives in the Red River Valley of Manitoba. Tyler chasing the sun to bring in this year's harvest. I'll have more on your forecasts coming up. Three million egg-laying hens are being euthanized in Ohio after the highly contagious avian influenza was confirmed. Now, the positive cases happening in a Defiance County commercial egg-laying operation. Also last week, High Path AI was confirmed in a commercial turkey meat operation in Morrison County, Minnesota. Checking the updated map from USDA, it shows the virus has now spread to 39 states, affecting more than 43 million birds. Now, market watchers are growing concerned about what these losses could mean when Americans start buying their Thanksgiving turkeys. It appears to be coming back in the fall, which has not been the typical seasonal pattern. Uh, it, it hasn't had a big explosive growth, growth yet like we've seen this spring, but if it does take off, it is, you know, we are detecting uh, herd uh, flocks out there that have uh, contracted avian influenza, and if that really takes off in the next few months, it could pose a problem. The CoBank releasing its thoughts on the situation, adding wholesale spot market values for fresh tom breast meat has eclipsed 650 per pound. Now that's a level previously deemed unattainable. At the same time, breast meat and cold storage dwindled to a low of just 43 million pounds in April before stocks began building up again during May. Michelle will have more market reaction to the latest supply demand numbers from USDA and what they mean going forward next in analysis. And later, farm and family take on new meaning for one couple showing through. Ag Day is brought to you by Enzone from Farm Shop MFG, which allows you to rehydrate your soybeans from 10 to 13 percent. On a 20,000 bushel bin, that's an extra semi load added to your bottom line. Order your Enzone fan now and get 13 percent off while supplies last. Corn and soybeans were off to the races after the bullish report from USDA. Michelle Rook has more on where the market could go from here. Joining us with the report market analysis, Darren Fry, Water Street Solutions. Darren, the biggest surprise in the WASD, the lower yield and harvested acres in the soybeans. How much higher do we need to go to price this in? Well, I think soybeans are probably going to open up now in that 1540 area. I think the real shock was not just the yield decline, but also the 600,000 acres that disappeared from harvested. And that really brings the balance sheet in a much tighter situation. Even though we all expect uh, Brazil to grow a big crop, hey, we got to get to January, February. We can't have any hiccups down there. So it was just flat out bullish today for soybeans. And we saw production cuts on yield in a lot of states, didn't we? Wasn't we did. it just the we West? Brought, yeah, well, the production was down a bushel in Illinois, up a bushel in Iowa. But then if you look at Kansas and Nebraska and South Dakota, we saw the bean, uh, not only the area get cut, but also the production as far as a per acre basis on yield. So it was pretty dramatic and yeah. the beans responded accordingly. So corn yield production, ending stocks cuts were all about as expected. However, we also saw a cut in acreage there offset by a big drop in domestic demand. And so going forward, what do you think? Do small crops get smaller and what does USDA do with demand going forward then? 
Well, definitely small crops get smaller. And I would expect that with this cut, which is like the fifth largest on record here from August to September, we'll see more cuts as we go to October, possibly even into November. Ear rates, ear weights will probably decline. We know that happens, especially the way the West has been. So I would expect a smaller yield. Demand will be reduced here as we take prices higher and as we face some economic woes. Unless we see some good data out of tomorrow's inflation number, we could see the macro uh, market start to pull back, and that will also spell some trouble for the demand side of the balance sheet. And quickly, Cotton saw a big pull down in production or a big uptick in production, but the market didn't look like it believed it. Yeah, it didn't. It got a lot more acres that probably were there when FSA uh, had them in July, but when they certified and they released them today, big jump in acres, but I don't think a lot of people believed it. We saw Cotton rebound strong off its lows to finish higher on the day. Okay, hopefully it's got some more upside then. Thanks so much, Darren Fry with Water Street Solutions. Full analysis at agweb.com. And we have more Ag Day coming up. For marketing strategies specific to your operation, contact Water Street Solutions at 866-249-2528 or online at www.waterstreet.org. Well, we want to start by taking a look at the flooding potential in parts of the southwest and a lot of rainfall is going to be possible over the next couple of days in the west and this is why we've got those scattered showers and storms going to be working their way in from the west coast and it's this area here highlighted in yellow all the way up through parts of utah back into nevada and even in parts of new mexico here where that's where the heaviest rain is going to be possible that's where some flooding is also going to be possible but if we take a look at the flooding potential. What you're going to notice is it does include places like Las Vegas and all the way up into central Utah there, Salt Lake City as well. So something we'll definitely have to keep an eye on through the next couple of days because take a look at this. Here's the rain in the west. Scattered showers and storms going to be likely as we head really all throughout the west and those will start to move eastward as we head through the next couple of days and then that storm system still bringing some rainfall with that cold front along the east coast and then more scattered showers and storms in parts of Florida as well. And that cold front really extends all the way down into the Gulf Coast. So that's why as we head through the next few days, that cold front still moving eastward, still dragging a lot of moisture across the peninsula there of Florida. High pressure though replacing it, and that's going to bring back the warmth as we head through the middle part of the week. Anywhere that saw temperatures below average, Great Lakes Northeast, it's going to get warm again mid to upper 80s as we head through the end of the week. And then you've got a couple of low pressure systems there in the West. That's going to keep things unsettled and a little bit cooler back there in uh, especially in Nevada and parts of Utah, New Mexico, but then high pressure continuing to slide eastward and we'll get going a few more storms here on the northern tier through the end of the week. But take a look at the temperatures as we head through this afternoon. 80s and 90s through the middle part of the country. A little bit cooler back in the west and then again dealing with the warmth out ahead of that cold front, but warmer temperatures going to replace this cooler fall like air as we head through the next few days. And we'll continue to track that right here on Ag Day. That's a look around the country. Now let's take a look at the weather where you live. Potsdam, New York, scattered showers likely a high near 71 degrees. Heading to Memphis, Tennessee, sunny and warm near 88 for the high temperature. And Glenwood, Utah, scattered showers likely a high near 74. Butter prices are hitting new record highs as grocery stores start to order more for holiday baking time. Now on Friday, spot butter prices hit a record of $3.17 a pound. The hot weather in California, cited by some to be one factor, along with drought impacting the availability of animal feed. But there are also other things to consider as well. Consumers have slowed a little bit in their butter purchases on the retail level. Demand is still overall good, but we've seen a real strong export market. And the last export numbers we have from the month of July showed butter exports up over 60% over the previous year. That's quite substantial. And that's where the real um, demand is coming from, is from the international market. 
Schmoll also said cold storage is not gaining on last year. He said it is currently running about 21% below the previous year. Want to cut carbon emissions on the farm? Well, one researcher says the simple thing to do is give cows more pasture time. That's the analysis of the Director of Sustainability at Organic Valley. It's the largest organic dairy co-op in the U.S. Now, the study was done with help from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Organic Valley saying the research found small organic farms that focus on grazing and organic production are low greenhouse gas champions. The researchers say their study proposes a method based on the amount of carbon staying in the soil from above ground residue, below ground residue, and manure. And lead researcher saying that the science proves out what they already knew was the case. When you have pasture-based systems and organic crop production, you have a smaller carbon footprint. Coming up, life on the farm can be pretty busy. Add in family, and it's even busier. But that's not stopping this family from opening up their farm and their hearts. How they're showing grit with grace. Ag Day, brought to you by Rumenson. Rumenson's quality, consistency, and efficiency make it the right choice for your cattle operation. Rumenson, trusted by generations. Grit with Grace is brought to you by Zoetis. Your dedication runs deep, and it fuels everything Zoetis does. To protect and support cattle and those who care for them, we are born of the bond. Learn more at bornofthebond.com. Life on the farm or ranch is busy, and oftentimes you can get lost in the day-to-day -day demands. Despite the craziness of running several businesses and raising three young kids, one South Dakota family did something incredible. As Farm Journal's Tyne Morgan reports, the family opened up their hearts and their home to foster and ultimately adopt in an example of Grit with Grace. So when we you know, first got married, we actually went through a really hard time of infertility, not being able to start a family. I really struggled with that, you know, just feeling like a failure. Struggling through the emotions of trying to have a child, the Radkeys are now blessed with three. And after their third child was born, Tyler had a calling. He just said, we need to do foster care. Yeah, apparently I didn't think we had enough going on. Yeah. Was, I, I, I honestly don't know what, what I saw that made me think of it. Amanda was on the road constantly giving speeches and doing other travel for her job, all while juggling life with three kids and their growing businesses. I instantly said, no, you're crazy. Uh, I, I don't, I'm drowning right now. That day, Amanda headed to the airport for a work trip and on the plane, her heart was changed. But again, God had a different plan because I got on a plane and the movie on the plane that day was Instant Family, which is a movie about foster care. We call the office, and say, we just want information, how do we get involved? And they said, you're in luck, the Mitchell training started last week, you guys can jump in. That was in April, and by August, Amanda was sitting in a coffee shop when an unexpected call came. It was the state, and they had two kids, and they needed an emergency placement for that weekend. And I said, I don't even have our license. And they said, yes, we just threw it in the mail. She says in the last two years with the pandemic, they've welcomed a dozen children into their home. We got a call for a seven month old baby. So we had that baby all of 2020 and uh, got to do all of her milestones with her and, and love on her. And on her first birthday, we found out she was leaving. And uh, yeah, it just, my heart broke into a million pieces because that was my baby. But a few weeks later, another call came. And that that's kind of where Alex came in. Um, he'd been in some foster homes before coming and going and he was now he was available for adoption and that was basically going to be his next home. They sent Amanda a picture of Alex. He had blonde hair and blue eyes just like her other three children. And I about fell over because I thought he look, I said he looks like our son and she said yeah I know that's why I called you and I said okay I need to talk to Tyler. Adoption day came October 5th, 2021, a wild adventure and constant chaos at the farm where Alex seems to fit right in. One night I tucked him into bed very early on and he said, Mama, can I be a, can I be a cowboy? And I said, you already are, buddy, because not because he lives on a farm now and we have cows, but because of how brave he is I, to change homes and to trust us. The Ratkeys have three goals provide peace with a place to heal, experience a family full of love, and introduce them to a household strong in faith. 
a recipe that's filled with grit and grace. All right, thanks, Ty, and that's all the time we have this morning. Congrats to them from all of us here at Agdale.